I guess that's a no. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started as far as uh, our test review for exam one. Okay, so let's, and this again, this is gonna be driven by you, hopefully not as much by me because I'm improvising here. So let me know what you wanna go over and we'll, we'll kind of start there and we'll grow from there and we'll kind of go over some stuff. All right, so let's clear what I got on the screen here. I'll try to save my drawings as, as I go. Okay, and hopefully you can read them. If you can't read them, let me know. I can, I can rewrite it, no problem. Okay, so where do you guys want to start? What do you have questions on? Let's write down what the top the test is on. By the way, we got D diabetes, EKG, we got lines, and we have ABGs, right? So where do you want to start? Um, with EKGs, um, I noticed in some of the slides, uh, we start counting like the 300 method at the, like the first QRS. So mm -hmm. that one would be 300. And then other um, slides that we went over, like the, we would start with the next QRS over and then that would be our 300. Yeah. So for that one, it, it's always the, the, once you line up your R wave, the next big box is going to be where the 300 if there was a qrs right there exactly on the next big box that would be 300 right you know what i mean you have a qrs and you have another qrs if your big box was right there that's going to be a um rate of 300 right so you got a solid line going right there a solid line going right there that's 300 okay so you start with this is zero and that's 300 oh, okay, uh, a rate of zero sense. but a rate of whatever it is you know that's your that's where you start Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to start with the EKGs or what do you think? Yeah, we can start with EKG. Okay. I'm about to say it's going to be a very short review session. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, 300 method that's when you're identifying rates. All right. So, what EKGs do you have to know? You have to know your sinus rhythm EKGs, your sinus EKGs, which have three varieties, right? What are those three varieties or sinus EKGs? Sinus Brady, sinus rhythm, sinus tachy. Mm -hmm. And sinus tac, right? Sinus rhythm can have your blocks, right? Your AV blocks. So can your sinus tac as well and your sinus Brady. Sinus Brady with the first degree AV block, sinus Brady with the second degree AV block. They all can kind of go with each other, but that's the look that came out, right? It's, so these guys can all have their flavor, right? AB blocks. What's another flavor you can add to a sinus rhythm? PVCs. Yeah, PVCs. Got ectopy, right? And the two ectopies I gave you were PVCs and PACs, right? PVC, PAC. AB blocks. Usually third degree is going to be its own thing. I'll just put it there just, just in case, all right? So you got third degree AB blocks or, or its own thing, but first degree AB block, second degree AB block type two, type one, those are all flavors for a sinus rhythm, sinus brady, or sinus tac, right? Second degree, et cetera, all right? And there's two second degrees, right? So then you got sinus rhythms. What else do you have? What if we get our sinus tac gets way too fast? We go all the way up there. What, what do we have next? SVT. Good, all right? So those we kind of classify under H or rhythms, right? So we got SVT. And technically, SVT is an umbrella term for our other atrial rhythms, which we have to know, which are what? A fib and A flutter. Good. A fib, A flutter. Okay. A fib, A flutter. Okay. I'll put an L there. A flutter. Okay. So then we got uh, ventricular rhythms, right? So we got sinus rhythms, atrial rhythms, and we have ventricular rhythms. What are your ventricular rhythms? You know, these are all your lethal rhythms. Uh, B tack. Good. You got VTAC. And I, it's good to put that at the top because VTAC kind of hangs on. Sometimes it's pulseless. Sometimes it has a pulse, right? So there's pulse. And then there's the other two VTACs, which usually have no pulse, which are what? VTAC. Pulse, VTAC. So pulseless, right? And we also have the reason I differentiate that because the, the treatment's different. Okay. Because we get, for every disease process, we have to know certain things, causes, symptoms, treatments, complications, and what do we do as a nurse? Nurse interventions, right? And it differs between pulse and pulseless. And then I heard torsades, right? Right. And technically, the, these guys could be multifocal or, or poly, 
I'm sorry, um, monomorphic or polymorphic, but the polymorphic is torsades and we got our monomorphic and either has a pulse or it doesn't have a pulse. Okay. And then so VTAC, I heard VFib, all right, that's a lethal rhythm. What's another lethal rhythm? Asystole. Good. So before asystole, usually we head there with what? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So VFib usually has no pulse. And yes, technically it's it's PEA, but it is uh, its own little thing. Okay. VFib, torsad. So our lethal rhythms would be our VTAC. Okay. Without a pulse for sure. Torsad is lethal. VFib is re lethal. PA lethal. Is this a lethal? So you can guarantee there are going to be at least five questions on the test that are going to be on lethal rhythms, right? And of course, be able to differentiate if there's a pulse versus no pulse because the treatment is going to be different for these guys, right? Whether it has whether there's a pulse or no pulse, and it's VTAC. Okay. So those are your rhythms you have to know for the test. Then, like I said, we have to know basic stuff about it. And I gave you the uh, EKG chart. You're welcome to update that. I didn't see anybody kind of updating it, but it has all your basic things as far as the causes and what the symptoms are, the treatment and nursing interventions and complications, right? Do you want to go down that path and talk about that stuff? Or what do you want to give specific questions on the, on the rhythmias? I think just that path would be good. Okay. All right, let's save this beautiful artwork right here and I'll upload it later. Let's clear all this. All right, so let's go to EKGs, right? So, ooh, hot pink. All right, so EKGs. So again, you want to know symptoms, right? or let's say you want to recognize it, right? You want to gen general stuff, you want to be able to recognize the rhythm, and that's half the battle, is recognizing the rhythm, okay? And then you want to know your uh, causes, right? What are your causes for all of for your EKGs, okay? And then, of course, your symptoms, right? Your treatment, what are your complications, Okay, complications basically is just you're giving me a, a CPR situation, a code blue situation, right? And then your nurse interventions, okay? As a nurse, what, what can we do? All right, so let's start there. As a nurse, what do you do for any kind of EKG change? Ask them if they're symptomatic or see if they're symptomatic. Yeah, you can, and that's kind of under the symptoms. And I, I try not to be as redundant, but yes, you're going to look for symptoms, but uh, we'll get there as far as what the symptoms are. But uh, we want to, to look further. Actually, can, under symptoms, you can probably put diagnostic tests. I kind of forgot a call on there as far as diagnostic tests. Things we want to do as a nurse, we want to get a, usually a 12 lead. If they have a pulse, right? If they have no pulse, we're going to switch gears. We're going to do CPR, right? We're going to... Uh, code blue, right? So a code blue situation when there's no pulse, right? When there's a code blue situation, let's skip ahead. What do you do with this code blue, no pulse? CPR and epi. epi. Good. So if there's no pulse, we're going to, again, hit the, hit the code, blood, code blue button. We're going to do CPR. And as far as the treatment's concerned, we're doing epi, right? And we're doing the whole ACLS stuff, which is message three, where you learn all the different algorithms about how to switch gears and such. But we're doing, you know, CAB, CPR, airway, then breathing, right? Before that, we're doing ABCs, right? We're going to do airway, breathing, 12 lead, oxygen, okay? And, of course, they're going to assess the blood pressure, right, vital signs, because that's going to tell you if you're symptomatic, right? Right. If you have a, a poor blood pressure, that's going to change treatment because usually most of it is just monitoring. We'll continue to monitor. Of course, you can let the doctor know as well, right? Let the provider know that something bad is happening. After you get a 12 lead, you notice a change in their rhythm. They were sinus rhythm. They went a flutter. We'll get a 12 lead to capture that and document it. The good documenters we are. And then uh, if they're O2, you get a set of vital signs. And that'll definitely tell us if we need to give O2. And that'll tell us if we need to uh, escalate this. So the blood pressure is low, right? That means they're what? The blood pressure is low. They are like over that threshold. Yeah, they're symptomatic, right? So they're symptomatic and then it's time to intervene, right? So every tachyrhythmia, so they have a fast heart rate, they're gonna have palpitations, right? That doesn't really tell us much, but we know they're gonna have palpitations, right? And S and S symptoms, okay? That's for every tachyrhythmia. 
bradyarrhythmias don't have that palpitations, but they are going to be symptomatic. So that's across the board. Symptomatic means we have a low cardiac output, right? And we have symptoms we can identify. What are those symptoms? Chest pain. There you go. It's a song, right? Chest pain, shortness of breath, breath, hypotension, confusion. Any one of those things means that we are symptomatic and it's time to escalate things and it's time to definitely get 12 lead O2 vitals, call the MD, get them in there so we can address the specific treatment for our rhythms, right? Tacky rhythms have their own treatment and Brady rhythms have their own treatment, right? Right. Okay, so they're symptomatic. We identify low cardiac output, got the low blood pressure, confusion, low urine output, all the you know, poor perfusion, sweaty, diaphoretic. These are all SNS things. But at the time when it's deciding to say, hey, it's time to treat them, they're, they're really looking bad. That's when we go ahead and say that's time to, um, you know, when, the, when the blood pressure is less than 90 or have a, um, you know, the hemodynamic confusion, et cetera. Okay. All right. So then treatment, how do you treat it? It's going to vary somewhat sometimes, okay? Okay, the TV just came on as a train. It's just disconcerting. All right, we so anyways, what's that? If blood pressure is normal, we give medication. If blood pressure is low, we shock. Yes, so if blood pressure is low, anytime we're going to be shocking, all right? So with bradyarrhythmias, we shock in the form of pacing them, all right? We pace them 60 times a minute. We're shocking them to keep that heart in sync. But as for tachyarrhythmias, yeah, definitely we're going to be shocking them. How do we shock them with tachyarrhythmias? Depending if it's pulse or not pulse. It can yeah. be synchronized. So they have no, or... they have a pulse and they have, um, and the rhythm way too fast, whether a flutter, a fib, even sinus tach. Sinus tach we don't treat until it gets symptomatic. Same thing with any tachyarrhythmia, right? So what do you do again? You're going to shock them how? Synchronize. Synchronized cardioversion, right? So we have to differentiate synchronized versus unsynchronized. You have to know that little chart about when when do you actually uh, shock? When do you actually have to hit the button that has says what? What's, what's the you have a little zol defibrillator you bring out and you have the yeah, there's an option there for synchronized versus unsynchronized, right? And how do, what does that what button say? Synchronized. Yeah, it's a sync. S Y N C sync. Okay, so you have to differentiate. If it, it make sure it says sync or not sync. And how do I know it's synced? Okay, it's kind of a nurse interventions thing. So synchronize, you know, we, that's our job because we're the ones hitting the button nine times out of 10. We're the one hitting the button that says to make sure that it's synchronized or not. So it's our responsibility because we're the last, last defense between the machine and the patient, right? So what does sync mean? It means we have a whole bunch of QRS complexes on the machine lit up or and by lit up, how do, how do I know they're lit up and they're gonna cause a uh, synchronized cardioversion, not a unsynchronized? There's dots on the- little Dots, right? Little dots, little check marks, dots, stars, white th fuzzies, whatever, but it, it's lit up and the sync is on, right? That means we have synchronized cardioversion. When do we not care about this? Ventricular fibrillation with uh, no pulse. No pulse. So without a pulse, we don't care. Okay. We're just going to turn the machine on and we're, and we're just going to shock, right? And that is defibrillation and that is a unsynchronized shock. And who gets an a unsynchronized shock again? That's someone without a pulse, right? And again, we have to know our lethal rhythms. Those are the ones we're shocking, but there's an exceptional little asterisk there, right? Those two of those lethal rhythms we don't shock. Who don't we shock? Pulseless electrical activity. So not PEA and not asystole, right? So those are the ones we don't shock. But if it's a tachyarrhythmia, it's fast, whether it be V-fib, V-fib, I guess technically is fast, V-fib, V-tac, torsades, and even with our, um, sorry, with the lethal rhythms with no pulse, we're going to shock them, okay? V-tac is the only one that rides the fence where it can have a pulse or no pulse. And that's when you have to decide whether my patient has a pulse or not and whether I'm gonna be synchronized or unsynchronized when you have VTAC on the monitor, right? So that means we're gonna look at the, go in the room and we're gonna assess the patient, make sure they're not brushing their teeth, right? Make sure they're not causing the monitor to display artifact that looks like VTAC. And if they have no pulse, so they look symptomatic with low cardiac output, they have SNF symptoms or cool, clammy, 
diaphoretic and they have started some chest pain. They don't know where they are. They're confused, right? If hypotension, blood pressure is less than what? 90. So 90. All right. So all these things point that they are not able to compensate. Okay. That makes sense. You still want us to talk about EKGs or you want to move on to something else so we can still keep going either way. It's up to you. Uh, how can we understand looking on the strip? It's PEA, pulseless electrical um, rhythm. So or PEA. Not. So the yeah. question has to tell you that it had there is no pulse of this rhythm, or the question prompt says you go in the room and there's no pulse, and you see this on the monitor. Okay. So PEA, it can be any rhythm really, except for you know, except for V-fib, and that's that's and torsades. Those have a special kind of PEA, right? And pulse is VTAC. But other than that, if there's an EKG rhythm on the monitor and there's no pulse with it, then that is PEA. Okay. So you can have like sinus tack on the monitor, but there's no pulse. Doesn't matter what something, it doesn't matter. There's no pulse. We got to intervene right away and fix that. Right. Does that make sense? What P, how you differentiate PEA versus other stuff? The question it will tell you that there's no pulse with this, with this rhythm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So causes, right, for our lethal rhythms. And you can even carry that over to our other rhythm yes too, right? H's and T's, those are our causes for our uh, lethal rhythms, okay? And other things that cause SNS stuff will cause tachyrhythmias, right? Which is what? What causes SNS stuff? There's all kinds of things, right? What are the things that cause SNS things? Fever, pain. Mm -hmm. So you got fever, increased temp, you got pain. pain. Hypovolemia. Say again. Hypovolemia. Good. Low blood pressure. And that's also one of our H's, right? And then also one of our H's, we've got some low pH, right? Hydrogen ion excess, right? Low blood glucose, right? And this is going to carry you very far as far in every disease, disease process. There's, oh, they have SS fired off because this disease process causes fever or this disease process this causes low blood pressure or this causes low pH, right? And high CO2, right? Causes low pH. And by that, I mean ABGs, right? ABG symptoms right there, SNS fires off. If I have metabolic acidosis, that's a low pH, right? Respiratory acidosis is acidosis. I got SNS symptoms. Therefore, I could have what? Any tachyarrhythmia, right? And if it's severe enough, then what can you have? Now you're in the H's and T's category, right? And now you have a um, lethal rhythm on your hands if the acidosis gets, gets bad enough, okay? So are you good with EKGs? Want to keep going with EKGs? What do you want to do? Can we do a couple of practice problems with EKGs? Mm -hmm. Like question? Yeah, so again, we can have any of those categories, right? Science symptoms, we've got treatment, we have nurse interventions, causes. So any of that is fair game, right? And diagnostic tests, et cetera, complications, et cetera. So it, any of that's fair game. So we have a rhythm on the monitor, right? So we have a fast rhythm, all right? So we have an EKG, the super fast rhythm on it, there's P waves in front of it. And if it's super fast and it's greater than 150, what does that mean? CVT? Yeah, that's SVT. Okay. And SVT, according to our chart, right, has its own treatment and such. So I could use, so could, there'd be a rhythm right there on the test and it says, what's the, what's the treatment for this? Okay. So nine times out of 10, you have to identify the rhythm. It's not going to tell you what the rhythm is. Okay. There would be like one or two, three questions maybe that have, Say, hey, which one of these is AFib? Which one of these is SVT? Which one of these is VTAC? But other than that, it's going to be, you have to uh, interpret the rhythm in front of you and identify what the, what the response is, right? So what is the treatment, right? So the treatment would be what for SVT? Adenosine. Use adenosine's first line, right? But any of our A, B, C, D treatment can do it, right? And by that, I mean A for adenosine and A for what else? Amiodarone. Amiodarone, right? B for what? Beta blockers. Beta blockers. C for? blockers. Specifically, which ones? The HPs. 
and non-DHP, non right? non of which there's only two, which is nice, all right? Everything else, we'll talk about hypertension, right? DHPs, that's, there's no question on D, questions on DHPs, that's for hypertension, that's fair game over there, okay? But non-DHPs, which are what? Diazepamine, Diltiazem, and rat mills. Those two guys are, are non-DHPs that are all about EKG stuff, right? And D, what is D? Digoxin. Digoxin. Not ties them, but dig, right? So these are all fair game as far as questions, right? Amiodarone, adenosine, rat mail, to tie them, right? Those are medications for SVT, right? And that's because SVT has also our other two varieties, right? We got AFib and A-flutter, okay? And then technically, uh, sorry, that's not what an L looks like, okay? So A-flutter. Right. And then, of course, ST, sinus tack, if it gets fast enough, and usually we don't treat sinus tack unless what happens? They're symptomatic. They're symptomatic. And then, of course, with fair game, we could do ABCDs, but adenosine is just a one, one, not one disease, but one EKG drug, right? Only one specific EKG we give adenosine for, and that's only for this SVT, right? For heart rate greater than 150. Okay, whereas amiodarone, beta blockers, digoxin, our non DHP calcium blockers, those are for all of our fast rhythms. Okay, our fast atrial rhythms. Which one of these is only for ventricular rhythms and thus ventricular tachycardias? Amiodarone. Amiodarone, all right. The amiodarone plays for both teams. It'll do, they do our ventricular rhythms. So that one's unique in that fashion. Okay, so amio is also for ventricular tachycardias, okay? So someone has VTAC on the monitor, we could get some amiodarone and hopefully we can turn it around, right? But then it's, we're gonna skip that and we're not gonna give the amiodarone if what's present, what's a, what's a contraindication giving amiodarone and any of these ABCD drugs for that matter? Blood pressure less than 90. Blood pressure too low, right? Blood pressure less than 90. Then we're skipping that and we're going back to what? Uh, the shocking, right? We're going to shock them out of that rhythm, right? Whether it be synchronized or unsynchronized, right? And how do you know if it's synchronized or unsynchronized? They have a pulse or not. Pulse or no pulse, right? Yeah, so a question will be, can easily be treatment. So we have digoxin as A, uh, it can have uh, deglutide as another one. So it's like, well, I'm not giving deglutide for this, right? You can have degludec, right? That's an insulin. That's not a EKG medication, right? ABG wise, you're gonna have acetazolamide, right? That's not gonna fix, fix, fix this, but it starts with an A, right? So you gotta be able to differentiate what the treatment is medication wise. And the only time we give these medications is if we have a good blood pressure, right? Um, so while we're talking about the ABCD thing, that applies mm -hmm. to all uh, lethal rhythms or? These are your fast rhythms. All right, okay. your fast rhythms, uh, especially your atrial rhythms, because only amiodarone is for your fast ventricular rhythms, which is VTAC, right? All right, so when we talk about like torsades, it has its own thing, like low mag for long, stopping QT drugs, those kind of things. And PEA Sicily has their own CPR epi. But this is just, in the meantime, we have a stable patient, which most of our tele patients hopefully are, right? You can, they're going to be on a, uh, an amiodarone. They're going to be on a beta blocker. They're going to be on digoxin. So we have to do all the details there, like dig toxicity. Well, the detail is about amiodarone, can prolong the QT and lead to torsades, beta blockers. What are we, it can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. It can, you know, rest rate patients we've got to be cautious with. Okay, it can lower heart rate to a certain degree. And then if we have a low heart rate, how do we know the heart rate's too low? On the monitor. On the monitor will tell us the heart rate, right? What about the EKG intervals? How do we know a heart rate's too long, too low? When, what would tell us we want to slow the heart? We want to say, well, it's not time for a beta blocker. If the PR interval is... Good. So PR interval is too long, right? PR interval is greater than what? 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.20, right? All these ABCD, these are all of my AV node suppression agents, right? All these guys suppress the AV node so all these atrial rhythms don't make their way down to the ventricles and cause us to become symptomatic, right? So 
by the same token, we can't prolong it indefinitely. Otherwise, we'd get what? Uh, heart block? Yeah, heart block, an AV node block, right? And that's probably a good reason to stop it. But also another reason is that the PR is greater than 0 0.20, right? What's another interval that'd be important to monitor with AV node suppression agents? QRS. Nope, not QRS and not QT, guessing. but QT is very <laughs> important for other QT prolonging drugs. But how about our R to R interval? Can't, doesn't an R to R interval tell you the, the rate? Yes. Right? How do you calculate a rate from an R to R interval? Count how many there are. March it you just count it, yeah. But if you just have an R, R to R interval in front of you, how do you calculate a, a, rest, a, a beats per minute? With the 300 method? Times, times 10. 10. Say again? Times 10. Times 10. That's only if you have a six second strip, a six second strip right here. And I'm gonna multiply by times 10 only if, right, if we're doing rates, you only do times 10 if it's irregular. If it's regular, 300 method. 300 for regular, right? But the third method is the R to R, right? R to R, that's the seconds, that's seconds per beat, right? And how many seconds are in a minute? Cause you want beats per minute? 60. 60, so 60 divided by the R to R equals your beats per minute. Okay, so if I have an R to R of 0 0.6, all right, that is pretty fast. If it's R to R of 1.2, that's pretty slow. For beat to beat is 1.2 seconds. That, that's a slow rate because the R to R of 1, 60 divided by 1, is 60 beats per minute, right? 60 divided by 1.2 means it's taking longer. That's a prolonged rate, right? That's our other way to measure our R to R, measure our, our, our heart rate. And if our RDR is prolonged, that's definitely not a good time to give an ABCD medication, right? PR interval is prolonged, not a time, good time to give it. QT, these ABCDs aren't going to affect it, except for which one? Amiodarone. Amiodarone, right? Amiodarone is going to prolong the QT. The other ones, no, they aren't. Those guys will all work on the AV node. Amiodarone too, but amiodarone also works on the ventricles and will affect ventricular depolarization time, right? So this question was asking about treatment, right? So treatment could be uh, medications. Treatment could also be what? Because medications you don't you don't give unless the blood pressure is low. And if the blood pressure is low, what's the treatment? Synchronized cardio version. Shocking them, right? So easy questions. They're gonna say synchronized cardio version, unsynchronized cardio version, do nothing, or start CPR, right? So when would you start CPR? When there is no pulse. No pulse. You can have SVT with PEA, that's, that's legal, okay? There's no pulse, CPR all the way, right? There's a pulse, but there's low blood pressure, can't give medications, so what's the option now? Synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion, right? Do nothing, the only time you'd answer that is if everything is copacetic, everything is absolutely right, is, is actually done, and there's no, no further things to do, okay? So that's treatment. This question is for treatment. Questions for signs and symptoms. Again, it could have symptoms as far as uh, palpitations, right? It was every tachyarrhythmia, but what other symptoms could you have? Our song. Yep, our song, right? And then, uh, sorry, I'll, before we get to uh, hypotension uh, for these guys, before we do medications, SVT has another little asterisk to it, right? SVT has one medication you do for it, and it has a, one maneuvers or one maneuvers. You have one set of maneuvers you can do for it, which are what? Vasal vagal maneuvers, right? So we got to know our vasal vagal maneuvers are things we can do to, to break this rhythm. Okay. The reason why you do vasal vagal maneuvers is A, they're symptomatic. And B, you don't want to do the medication just yet because non pharmacological always is better than pharmacological. And again, if our maneuvers don't work, then okay, so we're going to progress to medications, but we're never going to do medications and we're never going to do the maneuvers if what? Blood pressure is Blood low. Pressure too low. It's time to bring the big, big guns now because it's, it's way too, way too late, right? We, it was, it's, it's, they're not, able, they're not tolerating this rhythm. Okay. So that's treatment. All right. So SVT has kind of the most treatment associated with it because you can do non-pharmacological for it, right? There's no other rhythm you can do non-pharmacological for 
unless you think of CPR, I don't know. All right, so those are other things we would do first, and then of course medications. Okay, so interventions, those could be interventions there. What am I gonna do intervention wise? For SVT, we have non-pharmacological stuff. Otherwise, if they're in pain, fix the pain, right? If they have a fever, fix the fever. If they have low glucose, what do you do? Now we switch gears to diabetes, right? So hypoglycemia. Okay. Now, well, do they have an IV or do they have, a, not have an IV? Can they take PO or can they not take PO? Okay, so that's the, I can connect the dots between the two, two sections. Okay, do you still want to do EKGs or you know, the EKG questions are going to have a strip there and you have to identify the symptoms, the treatments, the interventions for it and know what, when it's right to give the treatment. What, what's the, when would I not do this treatment? Okay, when is it not indicated? It's like, well, I can't do that. I'm not a doctor. Well, doctors make mistakes and we want to, we're the last threshold before the patient. We have to know, you know, tell the doctor, hey, the PR interval is actually 0.28. I don't think it's a great idea to give that beta blocker, right? Or even that adenosine, okay? Hey, the rest of your rate is 55. Well, actually, it wouldn't be 55 if they have a fast rhythm, but say if they if they have a, um, you know, the QT is too prolonged and they ordered amiodarone. It's like amiodarone, yeah, that, that checks out. That's okay for my, for my SDTs, my AFib, my flutter, my, my sinus tax, my SDTs, but my... QT interval is what? What's a bad QT interval? Above 0.45. Yeah, greater than 0.45. They have my QT interval is 0.52. I don't think I should be getting this amiodor. I'm going to let you know that this is not good. All right. So we're the last defense against the patient. And we have to we have to test you so you know that. So that you know that you're the last defense and that you would recognize that something's up, something's wrong. You're not just going to give the medication because, you, because it was ordered. Okay. And DIG, it's a little bit on DIG, right? Same thing, doctor orders digoxin. All of a sudden uh, they say, oh shoot, the renal function is really, really bad. I don't think that's probably the best thing to do. Or they've already had digoxin and the DIG level is what? What's a bad DIG level? 2.5. And greater than two, greater than 2.5, 2.7, 3.2. Those are bad DIG levels. What are some other numbers to throw out there for DIG? 0.5 to two. Mm -hmm. What other numbers you have to know related to DIG? Normal calcium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium yeah. levels. Calcium, K, and mag, right? Because if those are abnormal, it's probably not a good idea to give DIG, right? They can become DIG toxic very fast, right? So which, which direction was it? It's only one direction for each of them. Low or high, which ones? High calcium, low. So caution. I can't know if I can do how it, I can do a caution symbol. I don't know. All right, so caution looks like a triforce. All right, so anyway, caution symbol, what are you gonna do? You got high calcium. So caution with high calcium. What else? Low potassium. Everything else is low. Low mag, low K, okay? And what's a low mag? You know your normal light levels. Less than 1.3. One, three, definitely low, usually 1.8. Most hospitals, 1.8, maybe 1.6, but 1.3 for sure. That's a low mag. And low K, less than 3.5, right? So hospitals, 3.4. But anyways, I'll give you a, a good low K, 3.1, 2.9, 2.4, 1.9, right? So there's some stuff with each, with each one of these, right? Dig has some stuff. Photo blockers have some stuff. Amiodarone has the only thing where you will monitor QT also. Adenosine. But across the board, blood pressure is low. Do we give these? No, no, no. All right. Same thing with the rat mill ties. And rat mill is probably the only exception where it's really not going to lower blood pressure that much. But we're not going to get. In, I'm not going to test you on this fine fine details with that. Okay. So that's kind of questions for EKGs and then VTAC again. VTAC and has the one version where you have a pulse and we have we have options. Whereas the other ones, the other ventricular rhythm is gonna have no pulse and we have to know the treatment for it, okay? Symptoms across the board are gonna be palpitations until they get symptomatic, okay? All right, are you all EKG'd out or do you wanna do more EKG stuff? Are we gonna have junctional rhythms? No, Junct that's next semester, message to you, look forward to that. 
we're just doing the ones we did on the first slide, our first page we talked about here. We're doing the sinus rhythms, the atrial rhythms, and the ventricular rhythms. And off to the side, we got some AV blocks we can sprinkle in there, and we got some ectopy we can sprinkle in there. And then next semester, we'll go down the sinus Brady path, and we'll go down that path where it gets worse and worse and worse, where you have to have paced rhythms and junctional rhythms and idioventricular rhythms. But that's, I don't want to throw new words in your brains. Okay, so where do you want to go next? Um, <clears throat> I'm still confused on the like non DHP and the DHP mm -hmm. as far as like what would we give. So the non DHP is the rapamil and diltiazem, which is correct. just for the heart, correct? Yeah, and it's only, it's an AV node suppression agent, just like our other ABCDs, right? Okay. Oh. And there's a little overlap with the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, which is for AFib, right? AFib has its own stuff attached to it, just like SBT has its own stuff attached to it. AFib, we explained a little bit more. AFib has other has specific complications, such as what? What's the complication of AFib and a flutter for that matter? Blood clots. Blood clots, and they can go where? To the brain. To the brain, the lungs, or anywhere really, but most commonly is the brain. So we're really on alert for that, right? So A, B, C, D, E for AFib, that, that C is no longer for cow channel blockers, all right? The, in that case, we've we've grown. So let me, let me describe that, right? So A, B, C, D, that was for our SVTs and tachy and our like sinus tach and all those things. And SVT, I mean AFib, A flutter, et cetera, right? That's A, B, C, D. But when we get to A, Fib, A, Fib has the analogy A, B, C, or the acronym A, B, C, D, E that we can do for its treatment, right? And its treatment, A is A, B, C, D, right? B is what? Or B is kind of there's overlap here. Well, I, don't, I kind of separate on my brain. But anyways, A was, was anticoagulants, right? And they put B and C for that. And D was synchronized cardioversion. E was elective. Uh, what's it called? It's catheter ablation. So that analogy, again, I don't, I don't kind of focus on that that much, but whatever makes you just makes you don't overlap them because there's different stuff we do for AFib. All right. So AFib, we do ABCD. We have to anticoagulate as well, right? Because what's the degris factor? They can clot and get a what? Stroke. A stroke or a PE or an arm that doesn't work, right? And how long is too long for AFib? How long can you let that go before your risk for, for, for clots? Two days. Two days, right? And that's your definitely concern, right? You took care of the patient yesterday, took care of the patient today, end of your shift, nobody started any anticoagulants. What gives, all right? So you're the last defense against the patient and you don't want them to have the complications. You didn't call the provider for that's for something to fix it. All right, anticoagulation. And then we can, just like with, Anything that's too fast, we can defibrillate. And not, not when we say defibrillate, sometimes it's a little misnomer. We're going to use what kind of cardioversion? Synchronized. Synchronized cardioversion, right? Synchronized cardioversion. How do we know it's synchronized? There is a pulse. The pulse. There's a pulse, yes. And how else do we know it's synchronized? There's dots. We have R wave detection, right? A little asterisks or X's or white things that tell us that we have R waves being detected, right? Because right, there's no pulse, it's PEA, right? But if there is a pulse, and we don't we don't shock PEA, but if there's a pulse and we have synchronization there, right? What happens if we don't do unsynchronized cardioversion? What happens then? Torsades. Yeah. Then you get torsades. You get R on T. That's our con. That's our uh, complication, right? If we we'll get torsades if we don't do that. Okay. So that's synchronized cardioversion. The last thing is catheter ablation. That you can do for AFib, a flutter. Okay, SVT for that matter too, sometimes. Okay, so that's how that's that's kind of there's some extra stuff there when we talk about AFib. We've got the anticoagulation piece. Okay, but we still have the ABCD. That's gonna that's gonna take you very far as far as our medications we give. Remember, A has two A's, so you can put a little little lowercase a in there if you want, because that lowercase a only used one time for one arrhythmia ever. And that's our adenosine for SBT. Whereas amiodarone is our can be used for any of them, right? All right, does that make sense? This was 
AFib especially, and a flutter. You definitely need to anticoagulate because the rhythm's irregular and you're at really high risk for clotting. Okay. All right. So you saw about 40 minutes on EKG. Do you want to go to diabetes or ABGs or lines? What do you want to do? I have ABGs. one more question about EKG. Sure. Go for it. Um, I'm getting confused between second degree type two and third degree. Okay. So yeah. So real quick, we'll do, we'll, we'll cut it off at 545. We'll move on to another topic. So these are AV blocks, right? Oop, AV blocks. That's supposed to be a V. All right, so AV blocks. So you're gonna have some, you got first degree, second degree, and third degree. So you're talking about second degree type two, right? Second degree type two and type one always have what? What's, what's the distinguishing factor? Prolonged QR, right? No, you said QR. QR, no, it's prolonged Sorry, PR. QR. And you also have a dropped what? QRS. QRS. QRS, all right? So just going along, going along, and then all of a sudden there's a dropped QRS, and then every every resume is like normal activity, right? And this one has a, a longer, 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 and then it drops. By the way, you have a drop QRS. Third degree, the rhythm is actually regular, right? These th second degree rhythms are irregular. Okay, third degree is regular. You got a QRS, QRS, QRS. It'd be super slow. It'll be wide too because it's coming from the ventricles, right? And then the P wave is doing its own thing. Also, it could be right here, right here inside the QRS. And it's doing its own thing. Okay. They're divorced. They're, they're not doing their own, they're doing their own rate and rhythm. Okay. Does that make sense? There's not drop QRS complexes. And usually the PR is like ridiculous. This PR right here is like usually super ridiculous. Okay. It's ridiculous. Okay. And also the P wave sometimes gets hidden in QRS complexes and hidden in T waves. So that's another clue as well. So the clues for a third degree block is A, there's no drop complexes. You measure R to R. Okay, I'm do a different color here. You measure R to R, it's the same, it's the same. And then measure P to P and it's the same, it's the same. Okay, there's no drop QRS complexes and the P waves and the, and the R to Rs do their own thing. How do I know that's, it's like, well, this P wave before that QRS, well, you gotta look at the whole strip and see, oh shoot, look over there, that P wave's over here and that P wave's over there. So that's how you tell the difference between third degree blocks and second degree blocks. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got like 20 seconds for EKGs. Any last minute EKG questions? All right, so let's save this. Where do you wanna go next? Diabetes. All right, so diabetes, all right, so. Any specific questions on diabetes or you just want me to free form? I'm sorry, what was that? Any questions on diabetes specifically or you just want to just kind of talk about stuff and maybe you'll have a question. Um, if we could talk about the type two um, oral medications. Okay, yeah. So again, every disease process you want to know causes, right? And we're going to be able to differentiate type one, type two. We want symptoms. We want to talk about treatment, which we're going to go next. Complications. There's a lot of complications with diabetes, right? Whether they be acute, like DK, HHS, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, and or chronic complications, foot care, uh, eye care, uh, renal care, okay? And then, of course, interventions we do as a nurse, right? So down the treatment path, right? So we got insulin, which could cause some acute complications, right? And then we got some orals that we can give, especially our type two diabetic can start on these, but type ones can have orals as well. Okay, so we got oral diabetics. So what's specific about the oral diabetics? Do you wanna know? Um, I didn't have any specific questions on them right now. So which, which part do you want anything specifically that, so you have, you wanna know side effects, all right? You want to know their um, nurse interventions, like who should not get it? So should this CHF patient get it? Should this kidney disease patient get it? Right? We want to know which ones cause hypoglycemia, because that's not good with someone has diabetes, right? You want to know which ones cause weight gain, which ones cause weight loss. So that's a way to drive your side effects and which ones do which. 
Because usually it's only like one or two out of the 12. And those are easy questions, right? It's like, which one of these causes weight gain? And you got to be able to recognize it. Which one of these causes MACE, which is another connection with our EKGs, right? So you have a lethal rhythm in front of you and you have to say, oh, shoot, which one of these diabetes meds can lead to this? Which one of these prevents MACE? And it's great for someone who has um, at risk for cardiac events. Okay. And recognizing the names, all right? So the glutides are the GLP-1s, your, your, your glyburides, your GIs, or your sulfonylureas, or meglitinides, okay? Metformin, there's only one metformin in a biguanide class, but metformin is for everybody. So you definitely wanna know how metformin works and what its complications are, because that's gonna be, be with you for, forever. Is that a good overview? Or you wanna go deeper into that? Do you have any more questions on oral diabetics? Are you going to be using abbreviations or the full name of the medication? What do you mean abbreviations? You mean the brand name? Yeah, like. So no you... brand names on NCLEX, no brand names on tests. Only generic names. Remember Coca-Cola. Yeah, they're not going to be sponsored by Coca-Cola, right? We want to have, unless they pay me some Coca-Cola. But no, I have, I have integrity. Okay, so we are not going to put... Um, brand names on the tests. It's only going to be generic names. And if I make a mistake and you're like, you're shoot, I don't know what this insulin is. And I put like a PDRA on there, then just let me know. And I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. So like I said, having 50 different students look at the test versus my own eyes three times is a lot more um, proofing than I could ever, I could ever hope for. <clears throat> so I, I've, make the mistake in clinical, I always say, so tell me about your core egg. And I've realized, oh, shoot, that's carvedilol. So sometimes, you know, in, in, in practice, you start saying brand names versus generic names, but on the test, you're going to be rest assured. It's always going to be a trade name if that's rest assured or not. Or not. All right. So where, where do you want to go next with diabetes? Are you done with diabetes? Um, there's a slide that's titled acidosis and DK and anion gap in mm -hmm. hyperkalemia. Yes. Um, I'm confused about that. Portion. So this, that's a complication of diabetes, right? Which type, which complication is that? Both type one and type two, get it? Type one. Yeah, but which, which complication is it? DK. 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 All right, so we're gonna go down DK path right here, right? So let's save this and go to the next slide. All right, so DK, right? So it has diabetes symptoms, which are what? Hyperglycemia. Three Ps, right? And of course, yeah, hyperglycemia. I mean, that's gonna cause our three Ps, blood sugar is high. And usually DK, the blood sugar is greater than 250, all right, 250 plus. It could be 240, it could be normal actually, but usually most commonly 250 plus compared to HHS where the blood sugar is what? Over 300. 600. Over 600, 600. Right? It's, it's ridiculously high. The, the sugar is way high in HHS. Okay. But DK sugar can be a thousand also. All right. But I'm just saying, with if you're com going to compare them, HHS always has high sugars, always more than 600. Okay. All right. So then we got three Ps here. We got some, um, what else? And three Ps, we got some SNS symptoms because they're super dehydrated or fluid overload. Dehydrated. Dehydrated, right? So they're not going to be cool and clammy, or sorry, not going to be clammy uh, because they are, are, and cool for them, I guess, also because they're they're going to be dehydrated, right? They have no um, no fluid to give, right? It's all been peed out in, in two of our peas, right? So they're going to be dehydrated, right? They got the headache and they got the blurred vision, all that stuff, all right? And we've got K's, right? K's for ketones. And this is where we can get into our acidosis slide that you're asking about, okay? So we have acidosis, okay? Also ketones, we got high potassium, okay? Also acidosis leads to high potassium, right? So ketones lead to acidosis and acidosis leads to hyperkalemia, okay? So, and ketones leads to cool small breathing, right? All right, so you're asked about acidosis, right? So how do you, is it, what kind of acidosis is this? Is it metabolic or respiratory acidosis? Respiratory. No. Oh, metabolic, sorry. Metabolic acidosis, no. good. Okay, 
So you can, I can just throw an ABG at you and say, which one of these ABGs looks like DKA, right? So you identify the ABG that has what? Low pH. A low pH, and what else? There's only two other things, right? A low bicarb. A low bicarb, low pH, because it's metabolic. And then the CO2 could be normal or? Or it can be high or low. High. high would be respiratory acidosis, right? Low, trying to compensate. It could be normal or low, right? That would tell us that we have a metabolic acidosis on our hands. That ABG lines up with DKA, right? So that so you got your ABG there, right? And the other thing is we have, let's take out the B and we have an AG. What's an AG? Anion gap. Anion gap, right? What's a normal anion gap? Less than 12. 12. Is it normal in DKA? No. No, so it's gonna be greater than 12, right? So anion gap greater than 12 and an ABG that shows again a, what kind of pH? Low. CO2 and bicarb. Okay. So we're gonna have a low pH, right? Oh, I chose white, that's not a good color. All right, so low pH and a low CO2 and a low bicarb, right? That's gonna be a sign of metabolic acidosis and there's some compensation happening there. And that's DK, right? The anion gap greater than 12. So how do I, how do I get an anion gap? It's equal sodium minus bicarb plus hydrogen. Oh, chloride. Sodium chloride. minus bicarb minus chloride. You can't measure hydrogen. That's the whole point of an anion gap because we can't measure our hydrogen ions, right? If we're using up all of our bicarb, right? We, let's just say we started the sodium at 140, right? And 140 minus this minus that. If we use up all our bicarb, is that number gonna be bigger or smaller? We're gonna subtract less bicarb, right? So our number is gonna be what? Bigger. Bigger, right? That just makes visual sense, right? And so I could just throw these numbers at you. You have a chemistry in front of you and you got a sodium of 135, you got a bicarb that'd be super low, five, let's say that's super low, right? What's normal bicarb again? 22 to 26. 22, 26, right? And chloride, normal chloride, 95 to 110-ish, right? So let's get throw a chloride at you. Let's give you a 105, right? All right, let's redeem ourselves from lecture. 135 minus 105 is what? 30. Good. Minus five is? 25. 25, which is bad, right? That's a really bad metabolic acidosis, right? That's a bad ion, anion gap. What if we don't have a bicarb? I only have a chemistry in front of me. What, what can I use in its, in its place? Or, so we can use bicarb or the venous CO2, all right? That's our CO2 on our chemistry. Not our CO2 on our ABG, but our CO2 on our chemistry. So we can have a CO2 in front of us, a CO2 of five, a CO2 of 22 to 26 is normal. CO2 of five is abnormal, okay? CO2 is just on the chemistry, is just the measurement of dissolved CO2. And how you dissolve CO2 in the bloodstream? CO2 plus water gets converted into bicarb plus hydrogen ions, right? So a venous CO2, a venous dissolved CO2 is equal to a bicarb, all right? So either one is fine. Okay. So that how can sense? we calculate, for example, what kind of numbers should be instead of like bicarb, for example, three, five, yeah, that kind of numbers or say can again, you say, you how should we, um, for example, if we take a so sodium minus bicarb minus chloride, mm -hmm. it always will be the same. So how should we, like what, what kind of questions can there be? Can you give an example? like? Three bicarb or five chloride, yeah? What kind yeah, of so I'm not gonna be asking you about a, hypo, a hyperchloric metabolic acidosis or anything like that. Metabolic acidosis I'm gonna be asking you about is someone's DKA. So this is a great question for someone who, had, who does not have ketones, who does not have acidosis, which is also a complication of diabetes, which is what? HHS. HHS. So the way you told HHS versus DKA is whether the anion gap is normal or elevated, right? So you have a chemistry in front of you and I ask you what complication do they have, right? Uh, they're diabetic, they're not feeling good. They got the three Ps, they got the SNS going on, right? The blood sugar is a thousand, 
All right, blood sugar, let's say 650, right? Because 650 could be HHS, 650 could be DKA. But what's the big difference in DKA and HHS? And I don't. The presence of ketones or not, right? And ketones cause acidosis, and acidosis causes anion cap. Acidosis causes a pH to be low, right? So that's how you tell the difference between the two. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a, and you have to say, oh, shoot, the anion gap is elevated. They probably have DK, or the anion gap is normal. They don't have DK. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. To answer your question, also, who asked about the, um, the slide on acidosis and ketones? Yes, I did. Thank you. So we did not talk about potassium, but you, that's a life-threatening H and T as well, right? So you definitely, and we got to know about potassium, how to treat it, right? What it, symptoms wise? Well, we're not going to go too much there, but symptoms definitely are going to have what kind of EKG findings? T waves. Going to have peak T waves as it gets slower and slower. Everything widens out. PR gets big. QRS gets big, QT gets big, sine wave, and then it signs off good night into a systole. Okay, so we want to prevent that. All right, so how do we treat hyperkalemia? Calcium. Calcium's always first, right? So that's always the thing you're gonna think of first. You're gonna stabilize that membrane, and it's like magic. There's very few things in, in nursing or medicine or in the hospital that are literally like magic, where it looks like a Hollywood movie, right? And hypoglycemia is one of them or you give the glucose and they just wake up brand new, right? There's not like barely any other diagnoses that are like that, but they wake up, oh, what happened? What, what happened? I, what's, I can't believe what that happened, right? So that never really happens in real life. Hyperkalemia is another thing where you give the calcium, you look at the monitor and instantaneously it changes to a normal rhythm again. They don't have the, the peak T waves go away. Everything, everything gets kind of resolved, right? They have those sine waves, those wide QRS. It just gets narrow again because you fix the hyperkalemia. But that calcium is only temporary. It only lasts for a little bit. Then it's going to get wide again, right? So we have three different ways we can attack the high potassium, right? So the high potassium, we're definitely going to give calcium, right? Give calcium there to stabilize the membranes. But then there's two other ways we can do to fix the potassium to, to rid the, blood, the bloodstream of it, right? And how do we do that? Extra. We're going to put it under the rug, right? We're going to put it into the cells, right? and we're going to either pee or poop it out, right? Mm -hmm. And to poop it out, we got three ways to poop it out. We got one way to pee it out, all right? And we got several ways to shuffle it under the rug and put it into our cells and take it out of the bloodstream. Because when it's in the bloodstream, it's causing hyperkalemia and that's now making our heart happy. So we're gonna make our heart happy first with the calcium and then we'll hit them with these other ones like a one, two punch or a one, three punch, okay? Mm -hmm. So what are, again, I heard a few of them out there. So what, what do we give? Dextrose, k mm -hmm. So we give not D5 water, but D50, 50. right? We're going to give some insulin with that, right? What else? K-exalate. k, -exalate. k is going to poop it out, right? And k is a brand name, so just kidding, All right? So we're going to do SPS, sodium polystyrene sulfonate. Just rolls off the tongue. But in real life, you can remember K X late K for K, right? Not for the test though. It's not going to help you. All right. But SPS is going to be for our help us poop it out. So insulin D50, what else puts it under the rug? It puts it into the cells. Bicarb. Bicarb. Good. Okay. How do we pee it out? Furosemide. Yeah. Give a diuretic. Commonly furosemide. Oh, and there's also one for extra credit, which I can't give that also puts it into the cells. What is that? Uh, beta agonist. Beta agonists, right? Agro. Not beta blockers. So differentiate what a beta agonist and beta blocker looks like, because that's an easy way to test you. So are we going to give atenolol or albuterol? Albuterol. Are we going to give metoprolol or salmeterol? So well, how do you know the difference? Um, beta agonists have what suffix? What last name? Um, OL, right? And in parentheses, beta blockers cause, have a what? LOL. 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 Okay. All right. So two more ways to poop out potassium. What are those? Magnesium citrate. Mag citrate, not so much. I mean, if you poop out enough, yes, you will get lower your potassium, but that's so not its primary indication. Sodium zirconium. 
sodium zirconium. So you got sodium zirconium, which you can buy the $5 store for your loved one for Valentine's Day. Okay, and what else? Pedorometer, Pat, Patron, Patron. Patron, <laughs> there you go. I'll remember After that. the exam, you can drink Patron. Not, not during this, this for Sally's lecture though. <laughs> Okay, so your mirror, sodium zirconium, SPS, these guys are all going to help poop it out and definitively get rid of the potassium, right? Yes. <clears throat> so you have to know your treatments for high potassium because life threatening. And this is going to come again on the final when we talk about uh, kidney failure because kidney failure leads to hyperkalemia, kidney failure leads to acidosis. All right, do you want to leave DKA? Talk more about potassium. What else do you want to talk about? Mr. Groveman, I actually have a question about um, the HCO3. Sorry, I was trying to talk before and my mic sure. was all screwed up. Um, I was like, why is it ignoring me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, in the ABG um, thing that I did today through the program, it said that the HCO3 is between 22 and 28. But then everything else I've seen is between 22 and 26. Is yeah. that a huge difference? And which number should we actually be going towards? For, for your mnemonic, yes. I mean, for your, the way you memorize it, yes. Because bicarbonate has four syllables. And that's 22 to 26. That's four, right? Doesn't work with 28. But no, no, no. The reason is they, they switch to 22 to 26. And it depends on where, what hospital you're at, right? Whether it's be 28 or 26. It really doesn't make a big difference. But okay. again, like I said on the in lecture, I'm not going to give you 27. It'll be okay. a, it'll be obvious. Bicarb is That's 34. Bicarb okay. is 20. Bicarb is 18. Bicarb is five. Right. That's going to give something obvious. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So what else? You still want to do diabetes because the other things are lines and ABGs. We kind of kind of hit a little bit of ABGs. Is there more diabetes stuff you have questions on, or you want to go over? We talked about you know, chart wise, you want to know complications because a lot of complications, acute and chronic, right? In SIM, we went over a lot of hypoglycemia stuff, but you definitely want to know how to, how to manage that for the test as well because those are tests, those guarantee be on your NCLEX as well about how to manage hypoglycemia. It's a life threatening thing and we can fix right away. So, um, on the quiz that we took, I know that it had mentioned um, giving like lifesavers for a patient who can swallow, but mm -hmm. who is in the hospital with an IV. So are we really giving oral instead of just pushing some glucose as long as the patient can swallow? Because I remember when we were doing the math, um, you specifically had a question on there that stated that we would give a specific amount of IV glucose if the mm -hmm. patient was not conscious versus another amount when the patient was conscious. Yeah. So can you just go into specifics about that? Cause I'm like, where do they keep the lifesavers on the floor of the hospital? Yeah, they're not sponsored by lifesavers or Coca-Cola. Right? They're sponsored by Shasta. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so yeah, PO stuff, we can give uh, glucose tabs. That's what they're called, glucose tabs in real life. And they have a different amount of sugar compared to lifesavers. But uh, you can't really go to the 7-Eleven and say, I need some glucose tabs. You're going to buy some glucose. You're going to buy some lifesavers. Yeah, so you got glucose tabs and you have glucose gel. That's how it comes in the hospital from the Pixis, right? And then PO-wise, we could also give what? Besides tabs of gel, a little more palatable would be what? Milk. Low fat yeah, milk. 15 grams of carbs, right? Of uh, fast carbs. Okay. Which are what? These are all kinds of examples, right? Or, uh, what not or, to or, give are what? Or, 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 yeah. OJ for CKD. Okay. OJ for CKD. If they don't have CKD, orange juice is fine. But uh, what else? You said, I heard, I heard it. What, what is it again? High, high fats. So fats, all right? We want something that's gonna get in their system immediately. Now, if they are, uh, once you fix it, all right? And how are we fixed? How do we know we fixed the, the low blood, blood glucose? They're not symptomatic anymore. True, and also their blood glucose is greater than 70 times two, right? That's usually tells you they're fixed. And then we're gonna sit them down at the Olive Garden with all you can eat pasta with some long acting carbs, right? 
So we give some long acting cards and that, that's, it's fair game. You can give fats at that point, give some peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We give a turkey sandwich, which every hospital seems to have for some reason. All right, so we have those as long acting carbs. That's once we're fixed. We're not gonna give those in the, this critical situation here, okay? So PO is PO. They have to be able to have a PO status. If they're NPO status, they can't get it, right? So NPO means a hundred different things. So you just have to be able to use your critical thinking and say, are they NPO or not? If they can swallow, should they be, are they NPO? If that's right, they can't swallow, are they NPO? Yes. Yes, right? They don't pass a swallow valve. They can't swallow. They have a, they have a slurred speech at this point and they're barely responsive. I don't, that's not safe to give them PO medication, PO stuff, okay? So then we go to the next, next step. We look to see if we have an IV or not, right? So IV wise, we're gonna give what? Dextrose. Dextrose, and what kind of dextrose? D50, right? If we're gonna fix it, then we can give some D5 water, right? If they're still MPO, right? We can give some even D10, that's a, a, a fix, okay? That's to maintain it to prevent hypoglycemia from occurring again, okay? But in the meantime, immediately we're fixing with D50, right? If they have a patent working IV, if they don't have an IV and they can't take PO, they're in the hospital or out of the hospital, right? Not every, people outside the hospital should not have an IV, okay? But uh, what should you do? I am, right? Not sub Q, but I am. And we fix that with glucagon, okay? So that's how you fix a hypoglycemic patient, okay? And we're gonna check to make sure that it always fit in 15 minutes, right? Check Q15. Okay, and if it's greater how than 7 2, then it's, we're good. Say again? How many rounds of D50 um, is typical for patients? So it's usually just one, one push, and that's, that's going to raise your blood sugar by about 50 to 100 points, and that should do it, all right? But that's, we, we got to keep checking it because it might have some cause of hypoglycemia, right? So we want to know our causes for hypoglycemia, right? What caused this to happen in the first place? Is something we can treat as underlying cause, right? Sometimes it's just simple as we, they need more sugar because there's insulin on board, right? They got a Detamir last night at 2200 and now it's four in the morning or let's say it's four, four in the afternoon, right? And they're hypoglycemic. So it's, it could be because they got the Detamir last night because they were made MPO all day. And the doctor, when they prescribed the Detamir was expecting them to have a caloric load expected to be eating throughout the day. And if they're not eating and they're MPO and they have Detamir on board, What's that going to do? Datamira lasts how long? 24 hours. 24 hours, right? So we're at risk for hypoglycemia. That's usually the more common reason. Someone becomes MPO, people weren't paying attention to how that they're on some long acting insulin or even insulin in the TPN bag, right? Or insulin and other, and or just that they're not getting enough calories. Okay. Were well, there other reasons why you'd be hypoglycemic? Liver failure. So liver failure and kidney failure as well, right? And then also you have um, steroid changes, right? So your steroids get changed, which would cause hypoglycemia. Your steroids being changed by being increased dose or decreasing dose? Decreasing. Yeah, decreasing dose of steroids because they're called glucocorticoids for a reason, right? They raise your glucose. Okay, so you want to know your hypoglycemia causes and how... So just for like each one of those complications, DKA, we have to know the causes, treatment, uh, sign of symptoms, and um, our nurse interventions. Same thing for hypoglycemia. Same thing for hyperglycemia. Same thing for HHS. And with the chronic complications, with those guys, we want to know how to prevent them, right? We want to know how to prevent our chronic complications. So how do you prevent chronic complications? Compliance. Yeah, that, that's easy to say, but how do you, how do you make them compliant? So you got to educate, right? Make sure they know that they're, they got to take their, 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 their pills, right? Like metformin causes GI upset, make sure they stick with it. Make sure they take it with, with food. You got to make sure they take their insulin, make sure. And for insulin, we got to know they don't inject the same site every time, right? Make sure they're taking it in the right spot. As far as hypoglycemia, make sure they don't have, you know, with exercise rules and such sick day rules that so we know all those things for hyperglycemia. But uh, they have persistent hyperglycemia. How do we know they have persistent hyperglycemia over the last three months? 
A1C is going to tell 5. you. A1C is going to tell you, yeah. For diabetics, you want them less than 7% once they already have diabetes. 6.5% or greater tells you you have equals diabetes. All right, there's just that. That's just because of the research and how the research papers were, how they define things, why, why we chose those numbers. All right, but we want the A1C less than 7%. That's, that's our goal with um, to avoid chronic complications. And what are your chronic complications again? And how do we fix them or how do we prevent them? Arthrosclerosis. So yeah, ASCVD, okay. ASCVD leads to hypertension, leads to CAD, leads to stroke, all kinds of bad stuff, right? And we'll get into that on Monday's lecture with ASCVD. And then uh, what else you had? Eye stuff, Lightness. right? So if I was memorizing this and trying to uh, understand this, I would just draw a person, right? And I'd say, okay, eye stuff, there's my eye stuff. And stroke stuff, there's my stroke, right? So it's CVA. And I got eye stuff. And then anything else in the head? Mm, no, but heart stuff, for sure. Got CAD, right? And we got erectile dysfunction here. We got uh, kidneys. We draw some kidneys there, okay? CKD is a complication. And also ASCVD leads to CKD, okay? And also hypertension leads to CKD. So we'll be connecting these dots more when we get to CKD and hypertension, ASCVD, as far as that, that piece. But diabetes itself causes CKD, okay? And you mentioned eye stuff. What other complications are there? Retinopathy. So retinopathy, that's eye stuff, right? I'm what else? Peripheral. Also has pathy in the name. Neuropathy. Nephropathy. Neuropathy. Okay. Neuropathy, right? So the nerves, you can draw your, your man with stocking and glove syndrome, right? Or just hands out over here, right? So we've got neuropathy, okay? And neuros also with ED. Okay. And then also neuropathy wise, we got the peripheral neuropathy. We got ED. And what's the other neuropathy we have? Nephropathy. No, it's nephropathy is damage ne to the kidneys from ASCVD. Peripheral. Peripheral neuropathy, erectile dysfunction, or what else? Autonomic. Causes hypoglycemia. Focal? What, no. what is it? Focal neural deficit? No. Focal neural is attached to what complication? Not to these guys, unless oh. you have a stroke. Hypoglycemia. Sorry. Hypoglycemia. Okay. So gastroparesis is one of our oh, yeah. complications. Okay. So I gave you some quick treatments for these guys. Hypertension, we want the under 130 over 180. That's how, where we want our blood pressure. CAD. We, and ASCVD, you want to keep our lipid profile low. And I'm not going to test you on lipid profiles this test. That's next test. But uh, CVA, CVA risk, they're probably going to be on some aspirin as well. Okay. And it also has to do with uh, CAD. And then CKD, how do we know someone has CKD? Their early CKD, they want to prevent it. BUN levels. BUN creatinine you can follow, but more specifically, we can do a urine test. To look for what? Protein. Proteins, what kind of proteins? Small okay. proteins, what kind of small proteins? Micro albumin. Albumin. Micro albumin. So that we wanna check as well, right? So peripheral neuropathy, rectal dysfunction, gastroparesis be complete here. It's my OCD clicking in. All right, so what's our other one? Amputation. Foot stuff, okay. And there's a lot of teaching with foot stuff, right? what kind of shoes to wear, what kind of things to do to make sure we're not getting foot complications because that can lead to what complication that leads to amputation? What's the complication of foot stuff? Osteomyelitis. 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 Okay. First, yeah, they get a diabetic foot ulcer and then they get osteomyelitis. Okay. So what I was getting at was how do we prevent this stuff? How do you prevent hypertension? Get your blood pressure low prevent, get your lipids low. But what is that last slide of the PowerPoint? What are, what are the things we want to do? These guys are at risk for infection as well. So I guess I can put that under, under over here, maybe. I don't know, infection. Keep cortisol stress low. Keep the stress low. That's a good, that's a good tip. 
but uh, sometimes it doesn't work in America and stressful jobs. So we got to make sure we're keeping the blood sugar under control by keeping the A1C less than 7%. 7 percent. Okay. The goal nowadays is a good uh, A1C, 7 to 9, plus no hypoglycemia. If you have hypoglycemia and you're less than 7%, that's not good. But to keep our A1C good, and we check it every how often? Three months. Every three months. Every three to six months, depends how bad the diabetes is. If the A1C was 9.6, we're coming back in three months. So the A1C is 6.9, come back in six months. But yearly, what do we want to do yearly? Foot exam. So yearly foot exam by who? A podiatry. So yearly podiatrist. Do you look at their foot yearly? With their, their spouse looks at their foot yearly? Mm -hmm. How often does their, their spouse look at their foot or their kids? Daily. Or the Every brave daily. uncle. Look at them daily. Daily, right? Daily look at, at the foots, footsies. Okay, so they're always looking at their feet daily for what? Sores. Any, Any type sores. of breakdown. They see an ingrown toenail, what do they do? Do they get the, the clippers from the, from the garage? No. <laughs> no, okay, they could go to see the podiatrist and get that fixed professionally, okay? So we know all the foot stuff and how we fix and how we prevent it from happening, all right? They're always looking at their feet, making sure they're putting lotion where? No, no between, between their toes. toes. Just everywhere except the toes. They can lotion up their whole body, and I, I don't care, as long as not the toes, between the toes, okay? Why is that? Just because of increase of moisture? Moisture, that's it, okay? And then as far as footwear, what kind of footwear should they have? Cotton, socks, leather shoes. Yeah, and shoes that fit, okay? Not shoes that are too fit, not too loose, but Goldilocks shoes, right? And on the topic of Goldilocks, can they have hot baths and hot jacuzzis and hot saunas? No. 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 Okay, so they have to have, uh, they check the temperature of the water, not recommended to be doing hot activities like that, okay? They can do hot activities, but not hot activities like that. All right, then what about else? What else? We got... Uh, other yearly stuff, infection-wise, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna do what kind of stuff to prevent infections? Vaccines. Vaccines, every vaccine ever, okay? Including COVID, including flu, including pneumonia, including whatever vaccine, they should be fully vaccinated. That is what is gonna prevent the complication of diabetes that we have to advocate for, okay? All right, uh, as far as gastroparesis, we have some medication we can treat for that. There's no real prevention. Right of the dysfunction, we have medications for that. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, we got medications for that, okay? And then we'll talk about medications for this and then in the coming exam two stuff. All right, so-, so I had a patient, I had a patient yesterday who was all just crazy things with his di diabetes. And his testicles were like the size of like a, like a melon. Is mm -hmm. that common or is that going in there with the ED? Because obviously ED is different than that. But I feel like, was that something else or was that the diabetes getting in there with as far as the swelling? Now the swelling is because of CAD causing CHF. And that then leads to peripheral edema, including the peripheral testes. Okay. That's as peripheral as you can get. That's outside the body. Yeah, you get peripheral edema in your feet. You get edema in your testes. Does he have peripheral edema in his feet too? Yes, and he only yeah. had one so. foot because that's what he was in there for. Yeah, so, so yeah. And we, we'll learn okay. towards the end of this course, all this stuff's interrelated. And diabetes is just the icing on top that's going to really accelerate everything. So we got to really got the diabetes under control so we don't get these chronic complications. Because these complications alone, hypertension, CAD, all these things are really, really bad in and of themselves. But when we escalate that with diabetes, it's just like putting it at a, a breakneck speed. So we want to avoid that. That's why it's so important. All right. So you want to leave diabetes and talk about the other two topics or where do you want to go next? ABGs. ABGs. All right. I was going to ask how you can relate diabetes with the central lines since we're already. So as far as treatment, all right. So calcium chloride is a what?
is a vesicant, right? So some, you know some examples of vesicants, right? And what to do about it, how to fix it, okay? So you're gonna fix it by slapping them, right? And how do you, what are some vesicants? Calcium chloride is one, D50 is one, bicarb is one, okay? Pressors are one, and that pressors relates to ABGs. When they're super, super acidotic, their blood pressure can fall. We'll give fluids first, but then if that doesn't work, we can, pressors can lead to it. Chemotherapy drugs can do it. We're not talking about chemotherapy, but you wanna recognize that that is a reason why I need a central line. What about TPN? What about TPN? TPN as well, yeah. So D50 is the vesicant, so is D20 plus, right? And D20 plus is a vesicant, right? So I should say D, starting at D20 and above, that's a vesicant, need a central line. But if someone only has a prophylaxis, are you gonna give D50 if they're hypoglycemic? Oh shoot, I can't, I can't. They don't have a central line. No, it's either you save the life or they, you, they, they have a, a, a injury. So the risk versus benefits in that situation. <clears throat> So yeah, so vesicants is, um, is it, what, I forgot what the question was. Why, why do we get to vesicants? <laughs> I don't know, either way. But let's, since we're on lines, let's just finish this up. And we have some ABG questions too. But as far as lines, you got, comp, you got indications, right? For a line, when do we need to have a line, right? So like causes, for instance, if you're doing, making a chart, what are some reasons for my lines? You need to identify the varieties of lines, right? Midline versus central versus a triple lumen catheter versus a IO access versus a, um, a we're not really gonna focus too much on arterial lines, but then a um, tunneled catheter versus non-tunneled, okay? So varieties, other complications are what? Clapsy. Clapsy is a big one, okay? And some other comp, and then we want to make sure we're doing dressing changes, right? Dressing change. We want to make sure dressing changes are good. Blood draws are good. Make sure we're not having complications therein, right? That's what we're looking at for for central lines that we're um, avoiding complications of the of, of those guys. It's kind of like a um, a segue from first semester where you learn about how to do dressing change and how to do a um, blood draw and how to do those things. So these are some extra skills for you. And the reason being is that we have CLABSI and that's life-threatening, right? Because CLABSI can lead to lactic acidosis, right? Because that's a infection. And we can then have an ABG that doesn't look good, right? And lactic acidosis, what does the ABG look like? Low pH. Low pH, what else is low? HCO3, bicarb. HCO3. All right, and the CO2 might be normal, but it also might be what? Low. Low to try to compensate. Okay. Yeah, so you want to be able to identify your non-tunneled versus your tunneled. Okay. What are your examples of them? What are your indications, vesicants, how to fix it, collapses? What else is in that, in that lecture regarding lines? Any other hot topics in that one? I'm not just omitting them, but what? Locations of central lines. Good, locations, and that's to can prevent a collapse as far as causes of collapses, right? Want to get those things changed away from what sites? Dirty sites like the femoral yeah. area. Away from femoral, right? We have intraluminal and extraluminal causes of collapses. What's an example of an intraluminal? Sepsis? So intraluminal was not handled correctly, right? Contamination of the port. It. We didn't do friction and swab it, right? We didn't change the tubing or change the bags in the right amount of time, okay? And usually you want to change your tubing how often? Every three days. Every three days is the hospital days. policy. Q96 is CDC policy, right? And then, of course, the bags are changed how often? Doesn't matter what bag it is. 24 hours? 24, 24 hours. hours. And both of that changes based on whether you have fats or TPN or um, what else? Blood, Blood hanging, Blood. right? So that's all intraluminal stuff. That's all things we are, we're responsible for. We're also responsible for the extraluminal stuff. Sometimes they have diabetes and they're immunocompromised, can't fix that. 
but we are responsible for the dressing change to make sure the bacteria cannot get extra luminal and make their way into the bloodstream via that insertion site. But yeah, lactic acidosis can result if we are not diligent about these things. Okay, so ABGs. So what do you wanna know about ABGs? Are we gonna to have to be um, aware of the um, the partially compensated and compensated on this exam? Yes. Okay. Whether it's partially compensated, uncompensated, fully compensated, yes. Okay. All right, so ABGs, same thing with every disease process, know the causes. What are my causes of metabolic alkalosis? What are my causes of metabolic acidosis or restroom alkalosis or restroom acidosis? What are my symptoms? Spoiler, it's SNS. All right, some stuff has unique things, right? Like metabolic, or sorry, restroom alkalosis has a very unique finding, which is what? Circumoral paresthesis. There you go. All right, so that's very buccal, very buccal, okay? Very uh, specific symptoms sometimes, but usually around the clock, it's gonna be SNS as our symptoms for almost every ABG stuff, All right? SNS, and we got treatments, and we got complications, and spoiler, it's death, all right? Coma, seizure, death, has every single one of the complications. And then nurse interventions, what do we do nursing-wise to fix this? And really, it's just to basically say, is it partially uncompensated or fully compensated? And to be able to interpret it the right, the right way, all right? So causes-wise, we think of what are our causes, all right, for metabolic acidosis versus metabolic alkalosis, Respiratory acidosis for respiratory alkalosis. So those are kind of delineated and your treatments, all right? So hyperkalemia causes acidosis. So you've got hyperkalemia treatments, just copy and paste what you know about hyperkalemia. And just to reiterate what's hyperkalemia causes, what kind of ABG derangement? Can you repeat that? Low pH. Metabolic acidosis. Low pH. So if we were to make a table here, right? We're making a table. And we have hyperkalemia as one of our as one of our, I guess it could be a complication too. All right, so let's, but we're going to treat when the potassium is high for which meta which uh, ABG finding. Our options metabolic are methodology. respiratory, respiratory, metabolic, metabolic. Right. So what is Meta hyperkalemia metabolic for? Acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. So then you just copy and paste what you know about that because it's exactly the same. When you're hyperkalemic, you're hyperkalemic. There's many causes. DK is one of them. Acidosis is another one. Those are the two things we're focusing on for this test as far as what causes hyperkalemia. Okay, what causes metabolic alkalosis? Ketones, lactation, lactic acid. Which one? Um, DKA, uh, where there are yeah, so acids. DK like can ketones. cause it. DK um, can cause acid, sorry. DK can cause metabolic acidosis, right? There's all kinds of things. Acidosis causes acidosis, like lactate acidosis, right? Lactic acidosis, we got renal failure on there. And what causes metabolic alkalosis? Vomiting. Yeah, for both these guys, we've got GI, right? GI, GI, but which part of the GI? Or acid, the lower part. So if you're secreting out acids, right? Where do you secrete acids from? What what hole? Mom. Vomit. Vomiting. 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 Yeah, vomiting right. So if you're vomiting hydrogen ions, are you get metabolic acidosis or alkalosis? Alkalosis. Uh, alkalosis. Alkalosis. All right. So vomiting. Whereas this is diarrhea. Okay. And again, that's the key concepts you want to know. And then, because there's a hundred different ways to describe vomiting, there's a hundred different ways to describe diarrhea. So you could have an NG tube to too much suction that could cause that's basically vomiting, right? You could have someone that's um, you know has a has take, took too many promotilants because they were they have gastroparesis. That's going to be causing too much diarrhea, right? They have an ostomy. That's too much diarrhea. All right, what's another reason for metabolic alkalosis? 
They did it themselves. They took too much what? Aspirin. Antiacids. Antiacids, yeah. Aspirin might, is probably gonna be, if they have an aspirin overdose, by the way, is metabolic acidosis. Oh. Because it's ASA, the A stands for acidosis or acid, acetylsalicylic acid. Okay. And respiratory stuff is all respiratory stuff. Are they breathing fast or breathing slow? So those are your symptoms, right? And treatment wise, make them breathe or make them rebreathe, right? Rebreathe into a paper bag, rebreathe into a non rebreather, rebreathe into whatever, all right, to get them to get that root to rebreathe that CO2. And which one? Restrial acidosis or alkalosis? Do you want them to rebreathe their CO2? Alkalosis. Restrial alkalosis. You got to rebreathe that CO2. So if you haven't already made a table, tables really worked for me. It may not work for you. A little concept map on one page a piece might work better for you. That's that's fine, right? But tables always make make me say, oh, shoot, there's the potassium. Nothing else has potassium stuff. I'll just focus on it right there, All right? Well, I'll take that back. Nothing else has high potassium. Which one of these has low potassium? Respiratory alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. Oh, metabolic metabolic alkalosis, right? Because of the way our cells compensate. Our cells want to maintain that pH and they'll do anything possible and they'll exchange potassium hydrogen to make it happen. So if our pH is 7.50, it's going to donate its hydrogen ions and take and exchange potassium. And that's going to lower our serum potassium, right? So for instance, we have a hydrogen ion in our cell. We have K out here where we have a deficit of hydrogen ions, our pH is too high, we're gonna exchange that. And that's going to make us hypo or hyperkalemic. Oh. Hypokalemic, okay? So that's how that's, that could be, that's how these questions could be asked. It's like, which one of these causes hypokalemia? There'll be an ABG there for you to interpret. And then you have to identify, is this one that causes hyperkalemia? Or is this one cause hypokalemia? Is this one going to be caused by DKA? Or is this one going to be caused by HHS, right? So HHS probably just be respiratory acidosis because that's dehydration, right? So metabolic alkalosis, they're vomiting. And I have this ABG. Which one, what is it? So that's kind of giving all the clues there. Okay. So it could I'm be- sorry, you said ways. respiratory acidosis causes hypo- oh, yeah. Yeah, I misspoke. So respiratory alkalosis, okay, the HHS, right? So they're, they're, they're super dehydrated. You're going to be breathing fast. You could be okay. respiratory alkalosis because you're breathing so fast. Right, okay. Okay, so yeah, so asking questions wise, so you could have an ABG in the, in the prompt or you could have an ABG in the answer, right? So if you're doing a study group tomorrow, it's too late right now, maybe. I don't know, there might be some places that's still open. You can then say, make, ask yourselves questions, all right? Tell me the ABG you would find for DKA. Tell me the ABG you would find for too much antacids. Tell me the ABG you would find for circumoral paresthesias, right? Or vice versa. Here's an ABG. Tell me the symptoms. Here's an ABG. Tell me the treatment. Here's an ABG. Tell me how, what, what this is. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so last last request. What else do you want to go over? Can you just talk about the um, the circumoral paresthesia really quick? So that yeah, was with from which which uh, which ABG derangement is that? So that would be a respiratory um, alkalosis. Alkalosis. Good. Respiratory alkalosis. They're breathing way too okay. fast. Oh. There's no real clear explanation of why that happened. They get their numbness and tingling in the fingers and the extremities, and they get it in their, their lips. There's no oh, clear okay. finding what, why that is. It's, it's likely due to the, they can't operate under that low CO, that, uh, that pH is way too high, and therefore okay. they stop working. They stop receiving nerve signals, and you get paresthesias. Okay. So the tingling of the fingers is right along with the um, circumoral paresthesia. Mm -hmm. Tingling of the lips, yes. Okay. All right, so as far as critical thinking questions, all right, so what is a critical thinking question? Because that's how much of our test? 70%. 70%. 70%. 
70%, right? 70% of 75. You can have your calculators on Monday, right? And also you can have scratch paper. So scratch paper wise, you can bring a scratch paper. I'll have scratch paper there. I'm sorry, you won't be on scratch paper because you might've done something nefarious and wrote an invisible ink or something, I don't know. But you have, uh, I'll give you scratch paper and you can dump your whole brain once time starts onto the, onto the paper if you need to. Okay, that, that's perfectly fine because you'll have that for the ink flux as well. You'll have paper, calculator, and a computer in front of you. Okay, so that'll be in place for you to, to use uh, on the test. Okay, so it's, if you're scared about math. All right, so 70% of every test is the critical thinking. So what's a critical thinking question? All right, so give me a topic and we'll, we'll try to think of a critical thinking question. EKG. EKG, all right. So we have an EKG here. So instead of saying, what is this EKG, right? Which is, looks like AFib to me, all right? So instead of just identifying AFib, identifying things is just a, is a basic knowledge-based question. A critical thinking question is a question that says, you have to come with, you have to come with skills, right? You have to be able to already interpret it. So you already interpreted it. And now the question is asking you what the treatment is, what the interventions are, what the uh, causes were, okay? And if we take like causes, for instance, okay? A critical thinking question is not gonna just say um, hypoxia or scar tissue. It's gonna be more, uh, it's gonna give you an example of it. Patient complains of, um, they have an SpO2 of 84%. So now you're using your interpretation skills, right? You're interpreting stuff. So I know hypoxia causes AFib. It could just be straight up hypoxia as the answer. And that's an easier question, right? Hypoxia. And anybody can memorize that. Hypoxia causes AFib. Okay, I, I'm good to go. But no, what, what does that look like in the real world? Because the patient has to ring the call bell and say, hey, you know what, nurse? I'm, uh, I'm a little bit hypoxic right now. If you could do something about that, I feel a little palpitations, right? They're not going to tell you they're hypoxic. You have to be able to interpret that, all right? And how you interpret interpret that? SpO two is eighty four percent. What's another way you could say someone's hypoxic? Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. PO two is less than eighty, right? You're short of breath. They're sweaty, diaphoretic, and hunched over the bedside table. We'll learn more about this with respiratory about all the symptoms of hypoxia. But you get what I'm saying, right? That you're given examples. You have to in, 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 interpret real, real world examples as far as what hypoxia means. So that's what I mean when you have to understand the material. You can't just memorize the material. You can't memorize hypoxia equals AFib and hypoxia equals AFib. And the next day you read it, hypoxia equals AFib. So there's not gonna be a question that says hypoxia. It's gonna be an example of hypoxia, a symptom of hypoxia and a lab value of hypoxia, okay? Just like acidosis, right? There could be an ABG here in the answer. And you expect the ABG to be what? That would cause AFib. High CO2. So acidosis would be the answer we memorize, right? Acidosis causes SNS, which causes attack arrhythmia such as AFib. I can memorize that day in, day out, but what is acidosis, right? Severe respiratory acidosis can do it, but most commonly, the most, the big boy acidosis is metabolic acidosis, right? So we'd see an ABG that shows some metabolic acidosis. And that's an interpretation of results. That's interpreting stuff that happens, right? Because the patient's not going to ring the call bell and say, you know, it's not rest acidosis this time, it's uh, metabolic acidosis, right? They're not going to tell you that. So you had to be able to detect that. And they could be a, DKA, a diabetic patient, right? And they're going to DK in front of your eyes. So you can see, oh, they have abdominal pain. They have this and that and this. And they present with AFib on the monitor. They just went to AFib all of a sudden this morning. So that's kind of the, that's a critical thinking level question is where we have examples, right? So if you're like a Brady arrhythmia, for instance, it's a bradycardia, like a really bad AV block, or something like that. Or a PEA, for instance, and looks for what are the causes of this? And you're looking at the answers, you're going to see, you know, hyperkalemia causes PEA, hyperkalemia causes PEA. But can you interpret that a K level of 7.4 is equal to hyperkalemia and that causes PEA. Does that make sense? That's a critical thinking question. A knowledge-based question is just, can you memorize something and regurgitate it? Can you say that hyperkalemia causes PEA or hyperkalemia causes bradycardia? Okay, there's gonna be knowledge-based questions, but that's 
70% of them are questions like that, where it's interpretation. Can I interpret what they're telling me is good or bad, right? Like foot care, for instance, right? Are they telling me the right things? So I know I'd have to, they have lotion, no lotion between the toes. They have to see the podiatrist. They have to get the yearly thing. They have to do, have well-fitting shoes and they can't use hot water, right? But you can memorize that all day long. And that could be some SATA questions. That could be some multiple choice questions, but what's the patient's telling you as, as far as teach back, if that's an appropriate response or not. Okay. So if, give me an example. What would, what would a patient say if they had bad fitting shoes, if they're, if they weren't giving, doing the shoe recommendations. Like they hurt when they walk. Hurt when they walk is a, is a clue that they might have some foot problems. Also, they would say that they always wear a size too small or they always wear, wear a size too big, or they could say that you got, they say, hey, I check my feet every other week. Is that good? Yeah. No, 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 we memorize check feet daily, right? So there could be a question that says check feet daily, and that could be an easy knowledge-based question, or a critical thinking question is patient reports, I check my feet every other day, every other week. And that is, you got to say, oh, shoot, that's, that's wrong. So that's a critical thinking level question is where you interpret what they say. We're not interpreting lab values or ABGs or EKGs, but we're saying, oh, should they have their, that, their, that statement is incorrect. Okay. So that's kind of where it's going. So if, like for met, metformin, for instance, they have metformin and you know, it causes lactic acidosis. Well, you can memorize every day of the week, lactic acidosis, metformin. L is before M. Lactic acidosis is metformin. That's my side effect, right? So, but what does lactic acidosis look like? What's the ABG look like? So there could be metformin and which ABG would you expect for someone who has met on metformin? It's a complication. Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. And it could just be straight up metabolic acidosis or it could be an, a straight up ABG with a pH, bicarb, and CO2. And you have to identify the correct one. That's a critical thinking question, right? So give me something else you want a critical thinking question on. Central lines. So central lines. So we, that's one of we mentioned potassium as a slide on central lines, right? So mm -hmm. potassium having the right amount of potassium, right? That involves math, right? So that's math critical thinking, and there's a, that's this is a math question on the test. Is K K for this is for lines? I'm gonna do a different color. Right. All right. So we have uh, blue, right? So for our lines, we have safe potassium, right? What's a safe potassium? 3.5 to 5. Well, yes, that's a true story, but what's a safe <laughs> potassium for uh, lines? We got peripheral lines and we have central lines. Uh, 10 hour, 10 so something per hour. Less than 10, 10, right? So less than or equal to 10 for peripheral IVs and central lines is what? Less than, 20, 20. less than or equal to 20, okay? 20.01 20. is too fast, okay? 10.01 is too fast for a peripheral line, but it's great for a central line, okay? So we have to use our math skills and we have to say, I just got a, this medication from the pharmacy. It was 40 MEQs and 150 mLs, okay? So that can be asked two different ways. What's a safe rate to administer it? Or the rate says, give this at 25 mLs an hour. Okay, so which lines, select all that apply, which lines can are safe to administer it through? And the select all that apply can be uh, pictures of central lines, right? So the, it could be the actual central line, it, it could say midline, it could say triple lumen catheter, it could say PA catheter, it could say Groshong catheter, et cetera. Or it could be a picture of one, okay? The picture is it's critical thinking, right? And this is critical thinking as far as what the math is, what's safe. So if we just use these examples, a midline and triple lumen, right? Which one of those can get 25 mils an hour? Triple lumen. Triple lumen, right? Because if it's 50 mls, and it's going 25 mLs an hour, I'm delivering 20 MEQs every hour, 
right? And you can do the math as well, right? Solve for MEQs per hour, right? So if it's 40 MEQs and 50 mLs times what, 25 mLs per one hour, do you use dimensional analysis, I get what, 20 MEQs per hour, right? So now I got my math, 20 MEQs per hour, and that is which one? I know this information. So I come in prepared with my, this information as my knowledge, right? I can easily memorize this for a full 10 or less, central 20 or less, but the question is not gonna ask you that. The question is gonna ask you a critical thinking level question. Do you know, can you understand that that's that, that that's the, the, the safe thing to do? Okay, so then you identify whether it can go through a midline or whether it can go through a triple lumen or a pick line, right, for instance. Right, any other critical thinking questions you want? Does that make sense as far as a knowledge base versus a critical thinking level question? And why these yes. tests are so much harder and people yes. stress about them much more? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah, it's not just me. I'm not the one that developed this and says, oh, I'm gonna trick all my students. This is every nursing school ever. And NCLEX books are like this as well. And you flip at the back of an NCLEX book, it tells you the level of questions. It, it uses, um, was it not Braslow? That's, that's pediatrics. What does it use? Maslow? Not Maslow, not Braslow. Blooms. It uses, it uses Blooms taxonomy. So there's a Bloom taxonomy. I'm not going to try to put more information in your brain. But when you look at the rationales in the back of the NCLEX book for the, the answers, it will say this is a knowledge based question. It's an identification question. It's a memorization question. The questions you want are the analysis level questions, the questions that are critical application level questions. Those are the questions that are example in class. Those are like truly in class questions. Identification question gonna say, point to the area where you would not put a central line in. Tell me how much potassium could go in a peripheral line. Tell me what the cause of AFib is. That's an identification level question, okay? 30% of that. The other 70% are application and analysis level questions where you apply what you already know. You apply the knowledge you have and you, and you uh, are able to interpret things, okay? All right, any other last minute requests? Thank you for this, it was very helpful. All right, good, glad it's helpful. All right, let me know if you have any questions tomorrow as you're studying, as you're going through the slides, let me, you can always direct message me or ask the class and someone else might have the same question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. You work. You're welcome. Have a good night. All right. Thank you.